All right. Hello, guys. I'm here with Dr. Ken Barry. Welcome to the show, my man. Thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Doc. It's my pleasure. I've been waiting for the invite. I didn't know where you were. <laughs> I found you eventually. We were, we were running around. Our schedules were all confusing. And, you know, it's funny. People may not know this, but we actually met in person last week when you were in Seattle for Low Carb Seattle. And I came over to Fogo to Chow and there was just a table of a bunch of really great people. We were chatting and then I had to go to San Diego and you stayed yep. there. So now we're doing a virtual thing, but we're, we're finally together and I'm excited for this conversation. Absolutely. I'm excited. Let's do it. So just a moment ago, before <clears throat> I started recording, you told me what you had to eat. And I think you should tell people <laughs> what you had to eat and sure. what, kind of, what kind of food is fueling Dr. Ken Barry for this podcast right now. And they can so how as I we speak, I've got a, I stopped using skillets because they're, t they're not deep enough. And so I've got like a five pound kettle, I guess you could call it, or pot. And so I, I chopped up um, six or seven pieces of bacon, just regular cured cheap bacon, and threw it in the pot and got it super hot and sizzled that and fried that up really good. And then all the bacon grease that would come out of that, right? And then on top of that, I threw, uh, it was about three pounds of ground beef. And it's the 70-30, the cheapest, fattiest ground beef you can get. On top of that, I put a bunch of Redmond's Real Salt. I put a little bit of mustard. I like mustard and it's zero carb. And uh, what else did I put in there? Oh, some, some Parmesan cheese I just grated. And so I just cooked that stuff up, man. And, and I was, it's so funny. I was just telling you, I'm thinking about posting on my Facebook. Uh, have you noticed that eating carnivore makes you eat like the hound off Game of Thrones? Because I don't even use a fork anymore. I've just went to a tablespoon because when I'm eating this meat, it, it, it's really like a, it's a primal event because I'm just scarfing this meat and the cheese is hanging and there's beef tallow and it's, it's not pretty at all, but I think that it's probably quite ancestrally appropriate. I think that my uh, grandfather from 50,000 years ago would be like at a boy in whatever language he spoke back then. And I think, and so I fried that up and ate as much as I could before we, started this that's amazing and i think yeah like you said evolutionarily that's incredibly <clears throat> consistent with how we would have eaten and what we would have eaten so just so people heard that correctly you just ate three and a half pounds of me <laughs> before yes. this time, which is amazing yes a couple of people on instagram have sent me videos of their babies or toddlers eating meat and i'm reminded of that they're the cutest things and i just think it's so amazing there's one video I posted. I should have saved it. I'm sure I can find it somewhere. It's, it's literally of maybe a two or three year old girl. And she is just putting this meat in her mouth, like just going, just going crazy on this meat. And you're thinking, yeah. I've never seen a kid do that with broccoli. That is, they just go wild for meat or bacon or the animal foods. It's such an interesting topic. You know, this idea, yep. my daughter, my, my, um, <clears throat> my uh, sister has a daughter. <clears throat> my niece is, you know, a little less than a little, she's just over one year old. And, you know, it's so interesting to me to think about what kids want to eat, what they don't want to eat. And we'll get into all of this, but these themes around carnivore diets and animal-based diets or animal-based predominant diets really undo all of the consternation and all of the, you know, every parent in the world who's just pulling their hair out because their kid won't eat vegetables can just rest yep. easy because you can give your kid a hamburger without a bun you can give your kid, you know, some meat and they will love it. And that's yes. really what they need. So it's just so funny to think that, you know, uh, you hear this so often, like how to get the picky kid to eat when in fact, kids are probably the smartest people. They're so connected with like yeah. their primal, you know, their primal programming. They know that the vegetables are not really ideal. Have you, I mean, have you seen this like in your practice? Oh yeah. Do you yeah, see Absolutely. Kids? And I do. I see kids. And before the disaster, my youngest patient was uh, seven, uh, two days old, just for, for, you know, newborn follow up. And my oldest patient who I just lost, she just went to heaven was 102. And so I was seeing the full gamut from two days old to 102 years old, up until very recently. And uh, yeah, I've had so many parents be like, I just can't get him to eat his vegetables. And I'm like, well, have you tried some ground beef? Have you tried some, you know, chopped up liver? Because even little babies, as they're weaning off the breast, which is what all babies should be on before they wean off, they, they'll eat liver. And you're like, nobody likes liver. Give it to your baby and watch. That is an Grind up some liver. Grind up your liver, put a little salt, and watch your baby tear it up, just like me. Just give them a spoon, and they're like, boom. 
Same for ground beef, same for any animal product. Basically, eggs, they usually love that, scrambled eggs. Uh, babies know what to eat. And I think, you know, you hear a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm an intuitive eater, right? Well, babies are the ultimate intuitive eater because they haven't even developed language or, or knowledge in any, you know, real manner yet. They're just going to eat what they know is either A, going to keep them from starving to death, which is sweet stuff, right? Because we we're all have that drive to eat sweet stuff. So that in the fall, between fall and winter, we eat as many berries as possible. So we don't starve to death during the winter. But we all know any time of year, you eat your meat, you eat your organ meat, you eat all that stuff. The babies know they'll eat that stuff. You don't have to force them to eat ground beef. They will wear it out. It's so cool. I mean, I'm, I'm really hoping <clears throat> my sister will feed my niece, you know, some liver. But it, 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 and I think liver is such an interesting example of this. If we grow up, I never ate liver when I was a kid. And we've, if we grow up and we've never had organ meats, they're a very foreign taste to us. And I think that a lot of yes. people don't like them because of that. But there are these outliers. There are these magical souls out there who have had organ meats when they're children. This is the hypothesis. And they love it. They've developed yep. the taste. They were given liver during this critical period of their development. And they, they loved it then. And they've loved it their whole life because they've been sort of acclimated to the taste. And it's so interesting because I wasn't. I had to do it kind of the hard way. And I've gotten to appreciate it now. But gosh, it's, it's such a valuable thing to give a child the, the taste for organ meats. And it's sad yep. when they don't get it. it. It happens quickly. I have a friend in Seattle who has a three-year-old son and she gave him some liver and he said, oh, that's gross. So that, by that time, the window's already closed. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, you may know that Nisha has a bun in the oven. I know. She's about Congratulations. 16 weeks along as, as we record this today. And we have full intentions. Our baby will be weaned off the breast onto keto carnivore stuff. And we'll have the other, you know, we'll have the veg available if, if little one wants it. But I predict that ground up beef and ground up liver or some combination of that will be the go-to food that our babies eat. And, and I think you, like me, are, you're kind of a student, not only of medicine, but also of anthropology, archaeology because you just naturally tend to go there when you start to think about these bigger questions of what should we eat and what should we avoid. And there's a, a theory in the evolutionary anthropology community, which is, is almost accepted as a theory. It may be still a hypothesis, but that kissing, that's where kissing originated as a show of affection and love is that when you were weaned off the breast, your mom would chew something up and then put it in your mouth, just like a mama bird and a baby bird. And that's kind of where the ritual of kissing originated. We don't have any proof of that, obviously, but it, it makes compelling common sense that that's how, I mean, that's the ultimate show of love. Let me give you the food out of my own mouth. And so I think that since we, we can tell from the carbon and the nitrogen uh, radioisotope dating that we ate as much fatty meat as we could get our grubby, dirty little hands on, and we ate veg. If, if it was that or starvation, we would eat some veg, no doubt. But I think the majority of our time on this planet has, has consisted of eating fatty meat. And when we were infants and toddlers, our mom would chew up that fatty meat and then give us the kiss of life, basically. Here is some nutritious food for you to eat. And uh, now we can we actually have blenders and stuff. We don't have to do it the old-fashioned way. But that's exactly what baby Barry will be eating uh, if, if I had, you know, if Nisha and I have anything to say about it. There was just another article in the news about a poor little three-year-old girl who had vegan parents. I don't know if you've seen I this. I saw this. I saw this. In Australia. It's so pitiful. She's two things. Actually, she's the size of a one-year-old, but her BMI is morbid obesity because she's so short. Her stature is so little that what weight she does have makes her morbidly obese on the BMI scale. And she had a seizure. And so they finally took her to the emergency room and she's in terrible shape. And I, my heart goes out to her. And also my heart goes out to her parents. Her parents are not evil. And I want everybody out there in the carnivore, keto carnivore community, you can't think that about these people. These people love their daughter. They just were misinformed by experts and authorities and gurus. And they believed who they trusted. And now their little girl's in trouble. And there's no telling what the long-term complications of that will be. But I guarantee you, Paul, we will never, ever see a baby who's carnivore or keto carnivore wind up in the ER because exactly. red meat is a superfood. If you locked a baby in, the, in a barn, 
right? If we're back in Nazi Germany, we can do this again. And you fed one baby nothing but vegetables and you fed the other baby nothing but fatty red meat. The second baby would flourish and be great and healthy and be athletic and fine. And the first baby would wilt and, and become very, very sick. And that's because meat is a superfood. It is really the only superfood. When people talk about Aussie berries or goji berries, I just roll my eyes like idiots. No, if you want a superfood, like I could lock you in my barn and feed you nothing but beef liver for the next 10 years. You'd be fine. You'd be fine. You probably look like a, you probably, when you broke out, you'd look like a bodybuilder and you'd kick my ass for locking you in the barn. Right. But th- nobody gets that. It's like, we've all forgotten how we're supposed to eat ancestrally. And I think a big thing that the keto carnivore movement is doing is, is reawakening this ancient knowledge. Hey, no, you're a human. You're a carnivore. You're an apex predator. You eat things. That's what you do. That's how you got to where you are. That's why human beings run the planet. That's why homo sapiens sapien has no rival on the planet is because we would eat you in a second. If we could catch you, we would eat you. That's how we developed this large brain. That's how we developed all of the skills that we have as human beings that make us human beings. And so it really, it saddens my heart when I see the, the well-meaning vegan parents abusing their children, but not even knowing that it's abuse. It's so sad. It just breaks my heart. But I promise you, baby Barry will be uh, vigorous and vibrant and healthy and eating his or her meat. I love it. I love it. I love it, Ken. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's a thought experiment and it's not even a thought experiment as we're seeing. It's just this idea, like feed a baby animal foods or plant foods and watch what happens. And, you know, I was just on a podcast with Rich Roll. I went on mm. The Minimalists uh, just a couple of days ago and it's not released yet. Uh, maybe by the time this episode comes out, it'll be released. But, you know, I respect Rich as a human being. I think he has good intentions. But as people will know, he's a staunch plant-based advocate. And, you know, he would say whole foods plant-based. But the question came up during the discussion. We were purposely trying not to make it a debate. We weren't trying to do back and forth like I did with Lane Norton because that always devolves. But the question came (laughs) up, the adequacy of protein on a plant-based diet. And he kind of said, yeah, that's fine. And I said, whoa, Rich, like, let's just think about this, man. Like, this is not adequate protein on a plant-based diet. No way, shape, or form. And then the question came up, is it okay for kids? And he, sa- and he seemed to think it was. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, I really, really objected to that during the discussion. If people listen to that conversation with The Minimalist when it's out, hopefully you'll, you'll hear me object and everybody can cheer in the, in the audience in their cars on the way to work. But I think that that messaging is wrong. And it's not that people are you know, malicious. It's that they're misinformed. And that's what we're trying to do here is, yes. is, to, uh, is to change that and to really improve, you know, uh, the, the, the amount of information out there. And I love this thought experiment. Like, has a baby ever become malnourished eating a lot of animal products? No, absolutely no, not. They are never. clearly the highest source of nutrition on the planet. And anyone who thinks otherwise really only need consult the nutritional literature. It's not, it's not even debatable. Exactly. And I think that, you know, if a vegan couple, if they are vegan because of their moral, religious, ethical beliefs, and they're of the age of majority, and whatever that is in your country, I think that's fine. You can do that. You can make that own personal sacrifice. But I do not get, think that you get to sacrifice your infant or your baby or your child. They don't get a choice. They don't get a voice. I don't think that's appropriate to enforce your sacrifice on them. If you want to do what you think is saving the planet and eat only a plant-based diet, hey, I am not even judging you. I mean, you do what you believe is right. There are people who believe, or at least promote they believe, that you can live on breath breath and sunshine alone. And they, there may be people on the planet who literally believe that. Uh, there's not many because you don't live long doing that, right? You know, you, you tend to sacrifice yourself. And But please give your child, until they're old enough, to make an informed decision about their diet, please give them animal products in their diet, even if it's just eggs, even if it's just butter, even if it's just, uh, you know, seafood without a face, please add that to their diet. If you're a vegan family, your children should not have to suffer because of your beliefs. 
And, and the, I think the tragedy also comes in the fact that a vegan mother is not going to be able to give their child enough mm-hmm. nutrition through the breast milk. It's mm-hmm. going to be DHA deficient, all these things. So this kind of segues right. into another interesting question for you, since you're seeing kids as well. This, people ask me this question a lot. I've kind of been wrestling with it. It gets to be a little controversial because I don't want to tell anyone how to feed their child. But I think there are parents out there now who are saying, hey, can I feed my kid a carnivore diet? Like, what do you think about this? And, you know, I've got my opinion and we can think about it. But I'd just be curious, you know, your perspective. What if one of your patients comes to you and says, hey, I've been eating a carnivore diet. I lost 50 pounds. I feel great. My son is six years old or three years old. Yep. I just feed him or my daughter animal foods. What would you say <clears throat> to that person? I would be, I'd be very blunt and honest with them. I would tell them there's absolutely no control research that shows that that's safe or good. But there's also no controlled research that shows that the standard American diet is safe or good. There's also no controlled research that shows that the diet that is promoted by the American Academy of Pediatrics is safe or good for infants, toddlers, children, adolescents, teens. That research doesn't exist. And so a lot of people don't realize that. They think that their pediatrician, when he recommends this carb-heavy diet, that that's, been, that's backed up by some kind of controlled research. It ain't. Okay. There's none. There's zero, not a single control uh, trial that shows that feeding your toddler over 200 grams of carbohydrates a day is safe or good or any of that. It doesn't exist. And so a lot of pediatricians don't realize that. They think, well, this is what I was taught. There has to be some research backing that up. That's what I, as a doctor, thought, Paul, back in 2002, 2003, 2004, I thought, well, I I mean, this is the AAP. This is their bulletin. This is what they recommend. It's got to be research-based, right? Because we practice EBM, evidence-based medicine. But I have since come to realize that EBM doesn't stand for evidence-based medicine. It stands for eminence-based medicine. And so the oldest guys with the most gray hair and the longest white coats, (laughs) they get in a room and they decide this is what we were going to recommend. And then that becomes part of the guidelines. There's no evidence backing that up. So with that conversation being had, then I would say, as far as I can tell from my studies of medicine, nutrition, anthropology, archaeology, your, your baby should flourish and be fine eating a carnivore diet as long as it's nose to tail don't don't feed your baby just ribeye your baby needs some heart you're, if you're going to do this you've got to do it your baby needs some liver your baby needs some heart your baby needs bone broth with bone marrow in it your baby needs all of that stuff and I, I i can only imagine at the avenger style demigods that people would raise <laughs> If they fed their baby, if they weaned them on, uh, I mean, if they fed them, you know, carnivore-based breast milk until they were weaned and then they weaned them off onto nose-to-tail carnivore, holy shit, Paul. Can you imagine the the Avengers we would have running around? I mean, they would be blowing every curve on every test, both mental, academic, physical. They would just be off the charts. There would have to be a special school for them, like the Avenger school, because you just couldn't, you couldn't put them with regular kids. It would be like putting a whippet with basset hounds and then saying, okay, we're going to have a race. Yeah, it would be, it would be like the mutants. It would be like X-Men in, in the best way. And I think that that's, that's a fantastic possibility. Yeah, I, I agree. I think from my perspective, as long as your child is getting enough calories and they're getting the micronutrients, I don't think kids need carbohydrates. But I'm not a board certified pediatrician. You know, I'm in, I'm in psychiatry. I do functional medicine. So... I, but I, it's an interesting question, you know, like, should we be giving kids carbohydrates? I think the flip side is clearly evident that there are lots of kids out there who are getting way too many carbohydrates these days and are having absolutely you know, juvenile diabetes. They're having, you know, these, these, you know, five or six year olds that are obese. So that, that is, is clearly that you can feed your kid too many carbohydrates. And one of the things that I really like about being a part of the carnivore movement is that we can think about what toxins might be in different plants and think like, well, if I were going to feed carbohydrates to my child or a child, what carbohydrates would I use? You know, I don't think any parent believes that feeding your kids Skittles for carbohydrates is a good idea, but you could probably use less toxic carbohydrates. But the idea yeah. that kids need broccoli I think, is, is far yeah. out the window these days. And I'm going to be much less judgy of a parent if they're feeding their child steamed broccoli along with their ground beef as I am with a parent who's feeding their child Lucky Charms and skim milk. I bet I'm going to be judging you. If you you even pretend that you think that's healthy, 
that that's not a, a compromise on your part as a parent. You're just too busy to cook some bacon and eggs. Come on, man. Come on. Your baby's growing every second of every day. Your, their brain is trying to grow and you're going to give them lucky charms and skim milk. Really? That's what you expect them to grow a beautiful, pristine human brain out of. Can you imagine no. the brains we would grow with salmon roe? You know, <laughs> exactly. Can you imagine what I'm telling you? If people, if you want, everybody wants their child to excel, right? Everybody wants that. I want my child to be the best and accelerated reader and, 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 you know, playing the cello, dunking a basketball. Can you imagine the children that we would raise if they ate mostly fatty meat, nose to tail, and maybe a little veg? Holy crap, man. Yeah, we would, we would actually reclaim what it used to mean to be a human being, because there's a lot of guys who probably who listen to you who probably know that testosterone levels, even a hundred years ago in men were twice or triple what they are now for the average guy in his twenties. Why, why is that? It's because they ate lots of fatty meat and they didn't eat lucky charms. They didn't eat a whole box of goldfish crackers and pretend that that was nutrition. They just didn't have that to eat. So they had to eat their fatty meat, and their bacon and their butter and their, that's, that, that's all they had. And so if you wanted to be a, a you know, a, a growing young man, you had to eat your meat and you had to drink your whole unprocessed, unhomogenized, unpasteurized milk and use all the dairy products that, you know, mom got from the cow yesterday. And so you just got so much more fat, so many more omega-3, so many more uh, fat soluble vitamins than anybody gets now. And, and I know Paul knows, but a lot of people may not know cholesterol is at the very top of the testosterone cascade. And so if you want lots of testosterone, dude, shut up and eat your fatty meat. That's where it's at. That's how you get that. You don't get that from eating stupid uh, frozen dinners and frozen pizzas and, and Chinese food. That ain't where you get that from. And egg yolks, you know, I mean, if we're talking diet yes. of cholesterol, egg yolks are probably the best. One yes. thing that a lot of people don't realize is that all animal flesh has about the same amount of cholesterol in it because it's in the membranes, whether it's a piece of salmon, a piece of chicken, or a piece of red meat. I would yes. prefer the piece of red meat because of all the other micronutrients and the zinc and all the other cofactors we're going to need to make testosterone and the other sex hormones. But um, I think that if people really want to get cholesterol in their diet, they're going to need to get it from egg yolks. But we can make plenty of cholesterol. And I think one of the things that um, I'm going to be talking to uh, Dave Feldman about really soon is the fact that when people do ketogenic diets, they make a lot more cholesterol and yes. that cholesterol gets packaged into LDL molecules. And so we see LDL rise on ketogenic diets and everyone freaks out. And many other doctors who are not as informed as you freak out when they see the high LDL, we should probably be rejoicing and saying, yes, you have lots of LDL and you know, hopefully the HDL is high and the triglycerides are low and there's a, there's a pattern of insulin sensitivity, but we should rejoice when somebody has a high LDL, a yep. low triglycerides and a high HDL saying, hey, you have lots of substrate in those LDL, you know, lipoproteins are all of these wonderful cholesterol molecules, which you are going to use to make testosterone, estrogen, and these sex hormones you're going to use to make all sorts of good things in your body. So I can't wait until that is the reaction in a doctor's office. When somebody walks in with an LDL of 250, they go, Man, Absolutely. how'd you get such a high? I, Good job. I, Keep it up. I'm really jealous of that high LDL. Yeah. Yeah. The last time I had my lipid panel checked, my total cholesterol was 350. My LDL cholesterol was 250. My HDL was 79 and my triglycerides were 59. And so I'm very, very happy with that. I'm proud of that. Like, I feel like I want to pat myself on the back and say job well done. Whereas most doctors in the U S and other parts of the world, they would literally shit their pants. Like, Oh my God, we've got to get you on a Zocor drip right now and, and preload you with Zocor and then get you on some Crestor every day for the rest of your life. Damaging their patient. I mean, they're literally damaging the patient by putting them on a statin and, but they're, they're just like the vegan parents. They don't know better. They think they're doing a good thing and they just don't know what kind of damage they they're doing. And then they'll ignore their triglycerides being high and they'll ignore their HDL being lower. They might give it lip service, but what are you going to do about it? There's no pill for that. Therefore the average doctor is, is disarmed. He can't do anything about that. And then their A1C is a little high at 6.1, you know, well, you got a little touch of sugar, uh, you know, cut down the sugar and eat more whole grains as if that's going to lower the, the A1C. And so they wind up dooming their patients to a lifetime of, of miserable chronic disease 
thinking that they're doing a good job by their patients. And it's, it's sad for doctors. I'm just as sad for those doctors as, as I am for the vegan parents. Cause they, they're, I remember back in 2002, you come to me, Saladino, and you had that, that total cholesterol of 290. Oh, your ass was going on a statin or me and you weren't going to be friends because I knew that's what I should do. I was helping you. I was slashing your risk of heart attack and stroke by doing that. I knew that was the right thing in my heart of hearts. I believe that. And I would have patients like, I'm not taking that. Mm -mm." And I'm like, why not? What's wrong with you? Fine. Go have a heart attack. I I had that same flippant attitude. I'm trying to help you. And if you don't know enough to listen to me, then just go have a heart attack. That's fine. That sound familiar? Yeah. Well, what, well, that's, that's a great segue. Like I think people would really be interested to hear your story and I'm really interested to hear that, you know, 2002, were you done with residency? Then when did you finish residency? So I finished, uh, I graduated med school in 2000 Uh and I did an an accelerated family medicine residency that was, it was kind of a, you know, you had to apply for it and I got accepted. And so I got to do a three year family medicine residency in two years. I combined my fourth year of med school and my intern year as, as a year. And that was, that was busy. That's awesome. But as you can imagine, right. Yeah. And so I got out and started practicing in 2002 and I had initial intentions of being an emergency room physician. I never wanted to set foot in the clinic again because I hated my time in the clinic as a resident. And I love my time in the ER. I love my time in the OR. I was trained in an advanced family practice. So we did we would assist in surgery with, and so like if you were my patient and you had a gallbladder, I would be first assist with the surgeon on your gallbladder, your cholecystectomy, right? And so we delivered babies all the time. We were always on call for OB. I, I, I first assisted on over 250 C-sections. I was, I was the primary surgeon on 10 or 15. I thought I was going to do an extra year of uh, uh, OB fellowship. And then I was going to be the OB doc in, in my small town, but the hospital wouldn't, they couldn't take the, the liability risks. And so I wound up, I was just an ER doctor. And so I was putting in chest tubes and I was, you know, doing all these crazy things in this tiny emergency department in Camden, Tennessee and loving it. And every single person I saw said, I like you doc, you should have a clinic. And I'm like, hell no. I'm never going to do that again, right? Because it's just, it's monotonous. It's just writing prescriptions. I don't want to do that. It's, it's boring. But after about the 2000th person said, you should start a clinic here, doc. I'm like, fine, I'll start a little clinic, right? And so I opened up this 800 square feet clinic in Camden. And it was an old dentist office that had been closed down for years. And I went in and gutted it, and remodeled it. And so I saw eight patients the first day. 12 patients the second day, 20 the third day, and never less after that. It just it just blew up. And so I had an electronic medical record. I thought, well, I, you know, I'm just going to piddle along and I'll see people. I'm going to be working in the ER. And I, in fact, did that for the first two years. I would still work two or three nights a week in the ER. And I never learned how to use that, that me- electronic medical record because I got swamped immediately with patients and I didn't have time to play with it and really learn it. So I, I never actually learned to use the EMR that great. And so after about three years of doing the the night shifts in the ER and seeing anywhere from 20 to 60 patients a day in the clinic, I started to get fat. I started to get pre-diabetic. I started to get joint aches. I had terrible heartburn. I had rosacea. I had dandruff. I had chronic allergic rhinitis. Just I, I felt like shit every day. And so when the Nexium rep would come and bring Nexium samples, those went to me. The patients didn't get those. I got those because I had to take two a day to keep that heartburn at bay, not realizing all the terrible things that was causing for me in the future if I had done that for decades. But I didn't know that then. I just thought Nexium, it's FDA approved. It's safe. I'm going to take it. It's fine. I, mean, I give it to patients every day, right? But it, at a certain point, well, I remember one day I bent over to tie my shoes and got short of breath. And that was a big, you know, moment for me. Like, what the hell, dude? Because I'm, I was raised in the South. And so there's this parable of the preacher who his parishioners caught him in the bar, drinking a beer, smoking a cigarette with a woman of ill repute sitting on his lap. And they're like, what are you doing, preacher? And he said, you do as I say, not as I do. And that's a parable that I remember my family telling me from the time I was little all the way. Like, you lead by example. You don't ever be that guy. And I looked in the mirror and I'm like, I'm that guy. I'm saying, do as I say, not do as I do. And obviously I'm not doing something right because my A1C is 6.1 and I weigh 297 pounds and I'm, eating, I'm, eating, I'm chewing up two Nexium a day 
et cetera. I could just go on and on and on. I felt miserable. I hated the practice because everybody I saw was also getting fatter and sicker. And I, every time I would see them every six months, I'd be like, oh, here, I'm going to start you on another pill, right? Can you imagine the torture, the monotony, the drudgery? It was terrible. And I thought, I can't keep doing this. I cannot be in here counseling people on how to eat and them looking at my, the, my shirt button over my belly button, like getting ready to dodge when it popped. Because at any moment, that button was going to go, right? And I was like, yeah, I can't. They're, I'm like, you got to lose some weight. And they're looking down at my belly. And I'm like, oh, no, that's it. I cannot. I can't be that guy. I can't be the preacher in the bar. I got to fix this. And so I, I climbed up in the attic <clears throat> and I got down all my nutrition notes, which you might be, you know, imagine me precariously bringing down this huge stack of stuff. It was a paperback book that was like this. And then a half semester's notes like this. And I got down and I went through all of it. Sum it up. It said, eat more whole grains. Don't avoid saturated fat completely and jog. That, that was my nutrition training for the normal person who wasn't in the ICU or the burn unit because there's special calculations you do for those guys, right? And so I was taught very well. If you were in a car fire and you were in the ICU and the burn unit for a month, I could figure your parental nutrition and I could keep you from dying, right? But as far as the care and feeding of just a regular guy on the street who's got a spouse and a, and a kid and a dog and a job, I didn't have squat to offer that guy because look at me, look in the mirror. I'm a fat, miserable guy. And so I had to go back to the drawing board. And the three books that woke me up was the Atkins Diet Revolution, um, Mark Sisson's Primal Blueprint, and Lauren Cordain's Paleo Diet. I read, I read those three books among many other books. But those are the three books that made me go, am I completely wrong? Am I completely upside down and backwards in every single thing I'm telling my patients? And so I thought, I, I don't know, man, I, this is weird. And I thought, I'm just going to do what Sisson and Cordain and, and Atkins, I'm just going to follow him for a month and just see what happens. And at the end of that month, I'd lost like 10 pounds. I'm like, what? What the heck? And I felt better. My knees were better. My heartburn was not quite as severe. And I'm like, I'm going to do this for another month. And so after about six months of doing that, I had, I had reversed all these things that I thought I was stuck with for life. And I thought, you know, I should maybe try this in some of my patients. So I picked out the most morbidly obese patients with a BMI of 45 or above who were scheduled for, for bariatric surgery. And when they would come for their routine refills of the, you know, anywhere from five to 15 medications they were on a day, I'm like, they're like, Hey doc, you've lost weight. You're looking good. And I'm like, well, you want to talk about that? Because I found this thing. And if you want to try it, they're like, hell yeah, I've tried everything else in the world. Nothing works. Let, Let me, what are you doing? And so I would give them kind of a a hybrid of Atkins and primal bulletproof paleo keto low carb. It was just kind of, I didn't know what I was talking about then. I just knew I was, I had stumbled on something that was working. And so I put my morbidly obese patients, if they were even interested, if they're like, nah, I got surgery scheduled next month, I'll just do that. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But I had about 10 guys take me up on it and they were eating, you know, the uh, bulletproof primal paleo they would cook in a month and be like, dude, I've lost 20 pounds. What is, what is this? Is there cracking this or something? I don't understand. They'd come back in six months, they'd lost 30, 40, 50 pounds. And they're like, yeah, I called the bariatric surgeon and I told him I'll, I'll, I'll cancel. And I said, I'll call you if I need you. But right now I'm doing well. Had guys on the knee replacement list, you know, already on surgery schedule for next month to get their knee replaced call and cancel the, the orthopedic surgeon be like I'll call you if I need you but my knee feels so much better and I've lost 40 pounds I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and at that point I started offering it and talking about it to any patient who had a BMI of 30 or over I'm, I, and I'm like you know skinny people don't need this this is just for weight loss right that's all that's what I knew at the time and so it was just it was working like gangbusters if anybody really tried it they could do it number one and it worked number two and number three it was sustainable they're like, you're telling me I ain't going to hurt myself eating ribeye and bacon. I'm like, to the best of my, I mean, I'm, I'm looking, I'm reading. I keep looking for the research. I can't find it. I think, I think it's safe. Keep doing it. I'm doing it. I'm not, it's not just you I'm throwing in the fire. It's me too. I'm right in there with you doing it. And so at that point I was like, yeah, I'm on to something here, man. This is, I don't know how none of my other colleagues in the community know about this, but this is huge. And so that's kind of my story of how I came to this. But I was, I was classically allopathically trained, 
nobody mentioned any of this to me in my training at all. I tripped and fell on this accidentally. Well, I'm sure that thousands of your patients are glad you did. And I think it probably makes it, you know, so much more relatable for your patients. Not that you should, or not that it's good that you were overweight, but if they see you, lo you losing weight and once the doctor is the, you know, the example, they're going to, they're going to catch on and say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Right. So, right. so it sounds like you were doing some low carb paleo type thing with people. It may not have been yep. fully keto in all cases. What do you see in your practice now with your patients on ketogenic diets or low carb diets? Like what kind of stuff do you see in your patients now with, with those kind of, with patients on those diets? Anybody who stays on it, it has complete, re and you can call it remission, reversal, or cure of your type 2 diabetes. I think any of that language is appropriate. A lot of docs get triggered when you say, I cured my type 2 diabetes. But, and let's just, let's just segue and talk about that for a second. More and more, I'm coming to believe that definitely processed carbs, but perhaps any carbohydrates are a slow poison. That's, that's, I think that's the proper paradigm to look at them. And so if one, yeah, I think alcohol is a slow poison. It's not going to kill you today or tomorrow, but if you drink too much alcohol for too long, you'll have disastrous medical health problems. So yeah, I don't think anybody argues with that. I think carbohydrates are the same way. If you want to have a piece of cake on your birthday, I think that's fine. If you want to have some honey once or twice a year, I think that mimics our, what we did in the past. But to tell someone, oh, you didn't reverse your type two. I mean, you didn't cure it. It's just in remission. So what if I took you, Paul, and I started slipping some mercury and lead into your diet, right? And every day I would just give you a little bit, not much, just a little. And you kept getting sicker and sicker and you just felt worse and worse and your skin looked terrible and your teeth were falling out. And then all of a sudden I stopped poisoning you with lead and mercury. And, and I pulled, I, I've got all the lead and mercury out of your diet. And you immediately started to feel better and look better and you, you, your skin got better. And you're like, dude, I feel good again. How would we talk about your lead and mercury poison? Would we say we had put that into remission? Or would we say we cured it by, by discontinuing the poison that we were giving you? And I think that's the proper paradigm to look at this. For a type 2 diabetic, they have carbohydrate poisoning. That's what they have. And when you re get rid of the poison out of their system and they're no longer a type 2 diabetic, I think it's perfectly reasonable to say you cured their type 2 diabetes, just like I cured your mercury poisoning by not poisoning you anymore. And I think that's the proper paradigm. And I think as people come to see it that way, because, you know, you'll hear people say, well, you mean I can never have what, fill in the blank again? And that would be like you saying, but doc, you mean I can't ever have mercury again? <laughs> I'd be like, no. You know it's bad for you. You can't ever have it again. It's poison. And when you see it that way, and then also once you eradicate the cravings with a month or two of a carnivore diet, you just don't crave that crap anymore. Then I think you start to see, yeah, I was addicted, and I was addicted to poison. And I was poisoning myself, and now I don't want that poison anymore. That's a good thing. And I think, I think that's how most people will come to see this ultimately, because that's what it is in my estimation. It's such an interesting concept. You know, I'm trying to wrap my head around it too. And insulin resistance is a fascinating kind of rabbit hole to go down. I would agree with you in that it does seem that some people are genetically predisposed to process carbohydrates very poorly. Yes, Those yes. People, it just seems like carbohydrates are poisonous, yep. you know? Yep. yep. And it, it, I mean, you see this with kids and, you know, I did an interview with uh, Dr. Jamie Seaman, who's an OBGYN. That one's not posted on iTunes yet, but it's on my YouTube. So if people are listening on iTunes, that one will be out soon. But, you know, she had the same sort of thing. She had, uh, you know, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and was able to reverse that completely when she eliminated carbohydrates. And you, you see some people who are just genetically predisposed to processing carbs so poorly, even if they're eating... Yep quote unquote, healthy carbohydrates, they do really badly. Yeah. And so it's, a, it's an interesting thing. You know, the, the only thing I would suggest that's interesting to me is that some people in the world seem to handle carbohydrates okay sometimes though. You know, you seem like- Sure, the sure. And the sure. trap ruins. And, uh, and I guarantee you, Paul, I guarantee you there's a bell curve right. for, mercury, for mercury tolerance as well. I guarantee you there's people I could give twice as much mercury and they'd be fine. And you're like, I don't know, they're very mercury sensitive. I don't know what's up with that. It's weird, right? right? 
But there are other people, you give them a tiniest amount of mercury and they'd be in the ICU immediately. And I guarantee you there's a bell curve for that, just like there is for every other thing when it comes to, to human physiology. Another great example is if I had, a, if you had an IV and every day I slipped in and I put a little fecal matter in your, in your IV and kept you chronically septic, right? And the doctors would look at you and they'd be like, I don't know, his white count's always high. It's almost like he's, he's like leukocyte resistant. That's the exact same analogy as being insulin resistant. No, he just doesn't like having poop in his, in his circulatory <laughs> system. He's not leukocyte resistant. You're poisoning with poop. Stop putting poop in his IV, and I bet he'll stop being leukocyte resistant. And I think that's the exact that's, – that's the, the mistake we make with our current paradigm. We say, oh, some people are so metabolically damaged or ill or sick, they can't, they can't tolerate – you know, carbs like other people can. And I don't think it's any uh, shortcoming on their part. I think that their D DNA, if you check the 23 and me is going to predominantly come from the North. They're going to have a, a large percentage of DNA of Neanderthal DNA. They're not made to have that many carbs. There's nothing wrong with them. You're just poisoning them and they're more sensitive to the, to the poop you're putting in their IV or to the mercury you're putting in their diet. Their, 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 their body's much more pristine. It can't handle that. Whereas other people, if they if their DNA's lived at the, the equator for the last fifty thousand years, they might be able to tolerate more carbs, and it, and they're not as insulin resistant as we might say. But I think I think they're just able to tolerate the slow poison of carbohydrates more than somebody like you or I, whose DNA came from the far north and with lots of Neanderthal mixed in. Yeah, it's it's such an interesting idea. I think that there's some really fascinating concepts around, you know, inflammation causing insulin resistance too. And that's such a, it's a I think, because I think really that's at the core of what's causing chronic disease and carbohydrate yeah. overfeeding or carbohydrates in general, yeah. perhaps, are just not good for humans. And it's it kind of, I don't know, it's interesting. You know, I did, I just released a, a, a podcast with Kevin Stock, who's a dentist. And that was a really interesting conversation for me. He's a carnivore dentist and, you know, Weston Price is, kind of the forefather of what many of us are talking about. And I really <clears throat> feel like dental health is the window to the body. And absolutely thing to hear his experiences. And I mean, I, I know you're doing mostly carnivore, almost entirely carnivore these days. I want to talk to you about that. But what I noticed when I went to a whole foods animal based diet, which is my the way that I'm saying carnivore diet right now, nose to tail. <laughs> I love it. My dental health got much better. And I was not eating junk carbohydrates. I've never yeah. been a junk food either per se. For the last 10 to 12 years, I was doing organic, paleo, moderate carbohydrate, and my dental health got better when I Absolutely. went fully when I went fully carnivorous, which would kind of support your your thesis, your hypothesis that you know, I mean from at least from a dental perspective, you know, I found that the plaque on my teeth was I didn't have to even brush my teeth. They were smooth all day, you know? Yep. How can it be yep. good to put carbohydrates in your mouth if they're going to cause bacterial overgrowth? And right. That's an interesting concept. And, you know, we see these tribes, the Hadza, the San, and Africa, and people always ask me, what about honey on a carnivore diet? Is that carnivore? And I think like, yeah, it's not, not from a plant, and I don't think it's got toxins yeah. in it per se, but, I mean, it, it causes my teeth to hurt, and I get bacterial, I get, yeah. you know, I get mixed <clears throat> teeth, I get fuzzy teeth. And if we look at the Hadza and the San, when they eat a bunch of honey, their dental health goes to, goes to junk. So yep. it's like, that, you're right. I mean, in that sense, like honey is a, just a small amount of a poison kind of, you know? And, Absolutely. And so and I think that's a very valid point, but I noticed also my dental health, I, even when I was paleo primal, I still had a little bit of gingivitis. I still would get a little bleeding when I brush. I would still, you know, it's like I have a little receding, but that has actually, the, re the recession is reversed. I mean, I'm 50, so I, you know, I, my, my teeth have been on this planet chewing food for 50 years, so I've got what little damage I've got, but my gums are as calm and uninflamed as they were when I was in my 20s now. It's ridiculous, right? But, and I, I, the honey thing cracks me up because I'll get people who will lash out at me. Honey is almost a religious thing for some people, like, no, I eat Maluka honey, or, or I, I take, I ta and they don't say I eat, they say I take <laughs> uh, lo local non-GMO uh, organic honey for my allergies. And I'm like, dude, eat carnivore for a month. You won't have no allergies. And then you can throw the honey away. But people get very triggered if you talk about their honey because that is not sugar. That is another thing. That is a medicinal food. And they truly believe that. And I, at one time, I used to, when I was a teenager, I had chronic severe allergies. I was like that every day of my life, right? 
and it wasn't sexy. The girls didn't seem to like it, but I couldn't help it. I had snot all the time. And I, I can remember we would get local honey from a guy and I would eat the hell out of that. And I would chew the comb all day long, like gum, thinking that was somehow going to desensitize me to the local pollen. When in reality, the pollen had nothing to do with it. It was the, it was the vegetable seed oils and the, and the carbs and the wheat and the grains. It was all that crap keeping me inflamed all the time. And now I could go and I could pitch for K in a 100-year-old barn with 20-year-old hay. And anybody with hay fever, that just made them sneeze when I said that. I could pitch for that all day and I might sneeze one time. And, and to me, if you've had chronic allergies, you don't understand. Like, that's miraculous that I could even go in a barn and not have a three-day flare-up of, of, you know, being like this for three days. It's really miraculous, but the honey ain't what did it. And so if you went back in time 100,000 years, our ancestors might find a honey tree, right, once a year, every year or two. What do you think they did? They wore that shit out. I guarantee you they ate it all, right? And they laid around in a sugar coma for three days, and they got a cavity. But then that they didn't happen again for a year or two years or three years. That was a great celebration when they found a honey tree, but it didn't happen regularly because first of all, you got a thousand bee stings when you tried to get the stuff because we didn't have fire back then. And then, you know, you felt like crap for three days afterwards, but yeah, I guarantee you they wore it out, but it was rare. It was a once a year, once every three to five years and very rare that that happened. And so even back then, they were programmed to love the honey. Yeah, but they just didn't have access to it like we do these days. And now I think it's really, it's, I think it's unethical for people to be like, oh, this is medicinal food. This is good for you. No, it's just damn sugar, dude. Stop it. And I think I love it because I think this kind of reflects back to us, this idea of like survival foods versus optimal foods. And there yes. are plenty of foods that humans, I believe, and I think you would agree with this, that I think there are plenty of foods that ancestral humans would have eaten over the last 70, 80,000 years, last 500,000 yeah. years that, that were plant foods. And I think they were primarily eaten for survival, for macronutrients, yeah. for calories, yeah. 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 not for micronutrients. Yeah. And I've said exactly. this before, but I think that in terms of human evolution, it's pretty clear that micronutrients lead to long-term health and macronutrients just help you survive till tomorrow. So That's right. at some yeah. point in our evolution, we, we were just looking for macronutrients. We were just looking for calories, however yeah. we can get them. And in my opinion, that's what fruit is, you know, fruit and honey. This is just, I'm yeah. surviving until tomorrow. And, you know, yeah. just because we did it evolutionarily doesn't mean it's good for us. And that, I think that yeah. those ideas get conflated and people get confused and they say, or they get a little bit, you know, they, they merge those two ideas and they say, oh, well, of course we ate fruit, so it should be good for us. And yeah, we probably yeah. ate it. That doesn't mean it's good for us. And I think all yeah. of, you know, the dental stuff and all of these other indications with fructose and oxalates yeah. and things like berries would say, Hey, this is not good for you. You probably did eat it. But that doesn't mean yeah. it's good for you. And I think a great example of this is the, the guy that they found in the permafrost. I, I don't know what name we're calling him by now, but he was, he the was ice I, man. yeah, right. The ice man. How many thousands of years ago did he live? I can't even remember. I, I think forgot it was like the story, five but or seven thousand, five or six thousand years ago. Yeah. And if you look at his carbon and nitrogen radioisotopes, he grew up on fatty meat. That's what he ate. I think his his isotopes are like higher than a than a wolf or a fox. Like all he ate was fatty meat. But they found a seed in his teeth, and they found some grass in his mouth, and they're like, and the vegans are like, up, oh, see, we're plant eaters. There you go. No, no. Maybe probably when he was getting, you know, assaulted and he fell down, he got some grass in his mouth. <laughs> or he was up in the he was up in the far north. He was probably starving. And so, yeah, I would eat grass and seeds and rat assholes if I was starving to death. That doesn't mean that's my optimal diet. Right. And this is I love this concept. You know, like if you can uh, humans now we can eat the optimal diet all the time. And if we accept, hey, animal foods are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet. You can eat that all the time now. We have become the best hunters on the planet. So yes. that's, that's one of the things that I think makes a carnivore diet super intriguing. Absolutely. So what have you seen in your practice? I mean, at, people, with keto, I'm sure you get this because, you know, you're a big keto guy and you've got a great YouTube following. And I'm sure you have a lot of patients on keto. 
and you're practicing clinically as a physician, you know, people will say, it's going to hurt your thyroid. It's going to cause cortisol overactivation. It's going to cause fight or flight nervous system activation. Do you see any of this in your practice? You surely have a lot of people who are on keto. Yeah. And so unlike the normal doctor who once a year, they'll check a BMP or a basic metabolic panel, a CBC, a lipid panel, and a urine, and, and maybe a TSH, and that's the extent of the lab testing you get. I am not like that at all. I ch- if you have any symptoms of, you know, and, and I, can be, I can be very creative with your symptoms in order to get, you know, lab core requests to pay for your lab panel. And I think any good doctor, that's a, that's a skill that you hone. And, and you're, still, you're still a young doc and you're in the kind of the university settings. So you don't have to worry about that. But when you get out and start practicing, if you check more than the, the, the panel I just said, you'll start getting letters from insurance and letters from LabCorp saying, we need a diagnosis to justify you. Why are you checking a, a fasting insulin and a C-peptide and a cortisol? What are you doing? I, we need a diagnosis. And so I found quickly that fatigue and shortness of breath and, and, and a couple of other kind of generalized diagnosis will pay for pretty much any lab test on the planet. And so a lot of my patients have fatigue and shortness of breath. I mean, who doesn't? Who wouldn't want a little, a little energy that more than you already have? That's fatigue, isn't it? And so I had to be a little bit creative with my diagnosis, but I check a ton of labs. And so to answer your question, I've seen nothing but uh, the only thing I've seen happen to thyroid function on keto carnivore is that it improves. Hmm. I've had multiple patients I have to decrease who have hypothyroidism. I have to decrease their their thyroid medication because they don't need as much anymore because the thyroid function is picking up on keto carnivore. I've had, oh my God, hundreds of patients reverse their type two diabetes and either become non-diabetic or become at least pre-diabetic and, and stop anywhere from one to four different medications that were supposed to be helping their pancreas deal with, you know, because their metabolism is broken. They just can't eat the normal amount of carbs, right? I've seen multiple, oh, probably well over a hundred guys improve their testosterone without supplementing, but just with eating keto carnivore. And I've seen, I've had, and it's really an epidemic that's not talked about enough. I've had multiple 20 something year old guys with a, with a a total testosterone of 190 or 210 or 280. I'm like, dude, you're almost a girl. This is terrible. Put down the goldfish crackers and put down the damn granola bars. What are you doing? And when they go fatty meat keto or carnivore, they double or triple their, their testosterone within three to six months. And it's miraculous, but actually it ain't. It's just what happens when you feed a, a human the proper human diet. Uh, but mo- basically any glandular problem, whether it's with the adrenals, the gonads, the thyroid, the pancreas, all of those things get either better or less severe, depending on how you want to describe it, with ke- a fatty meat, heavy keto, or with carnivore. They just get better. That's all I've seen. I haven't seen anyone have a negative consequence of keto. The, the two negative things that I've had people come to my office truly pissed off about was number one, thanks a lot, doc. I got pregnant. I'm 52. I thought I was done with this and I, I've been eating keto, you know, having fatty meat keto for six months. I'm pregnant. Thanks. I didn't really have that in my life plan, but now, you know, I started having periods again. Now I'm pregnant. Thanks a lot. And they were, they were a little miffed at me later. They were happy. And they're like, no, nah, I'm sorry about that. You know, that's number one. Number two is, you know, Doc, I'm broke as a joke. I got two jobs. I got a wife and five kids. I'm trying to get by. I keep having to go to the store buy more clothes. More. When's this going to stop? And I'm like, when you approach your ideal body weight, it'll stop. And then you can just stop having to buy new clothes all the time. <laughs> but that's the two things I've had patients complain about was that they, they, they you know, broke because they're having to buy new clothes constantly or they got knocked up when they thought that chapter of their life was over. It's, it's so interesting because you'll see people kind of throw these criticisms out. Ketogenic diet's going to mess up your thyroid. And that's not something I've seen either. You know, I've got kind of private clients that I see outside of residency. And occasionally I see the free T3 go down. But I think that that probably has to do with uh, tissue levels being different than serum levels because we don't see right. the basal metabolic rate change. Clearly, people are not gaining weight. They usually feel better and the TSH isn't going anywhere. So there's not really... I don't think I think they've become they've become less T3 resistant. Probably. Yeah. Right? We're back to that same old saw. 
I, I think I don't think you've hurt their thyroid function at all. I think their tissue now is just more sensitive, and they don't need as much circulating T3. I think exactly. that's yeah, yeah. So and I've I've definitely not seen. I do a lot of AM cortisols on people. I don't see people with AM cortisols off the chart, or even these adrenal salivary curves that are abnormal on these things at all. So I would say that in my experience as well, I'll echo yours. A ketogenic diet, a carnivore diet, does not overtax your adrenals. That is just not something we see yeah. clinically. And the people, generally the people who are claiming that are not even physicians. They're not even people yeah. seeing real patients. So I feel like yeah. your experience and my experience should speak strongly to people with regard to that. And this idea that ketogenic yeah. diets or carnivore diets are going to increase your fight or flight nervous system or increase, you know, uh, sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine, you know, uh, you know, norepinephrine. These are just these right. are just not true. Like we do not see these type of things now. Every person, well, no, not at all. And if those things were true, I would see a worsening of mental mental illness, right? If, right. if your cortisol and your epinephrine were chronically high, your anxiety would be worse. There's no way it couldn't be. But actually, what I have seen in my clinical practice is I've had multiple people be able to to wean down and stop their medications that they take for chronic anxiety or chronic depression or OCD or any of these other mental conditions. They all get better with fatty meat keto or with carnivore. And uh, there's one huge myth out there that I love to dispel every time I get a chance. There's actually a, a guru in the keto space that's huge who says that if you don't eat seven to 10 cups of vegetables a day, that <laughs> keto will give you fatty liver. That that's it's going to happen, yes. And so many, and it's such it's, it's such incorrect information. And so let me just say, let me be very blunt about this. There is no diet that will reverse fatty liver quicker than fatty meat keto or carnivore. I have I have seen multiple diets tried, I, and you know, big pharma right now. There's no telling how many billions they've spent trying to come up with a pill or an injection to cure fatty liver. Oh my God, that's going to be multi-billion dollars, right? But they can't do it because it's the diet. It's the poison. Remove the carbs and the fatty liver and fatty pancreas, which is actually worse, will go completely away. You do not have to eat any amount of, of vegetables every day to protect your liver from keto or carnivore. That is bullshit. That's not There's true. No truth, no truth to that. Take away the carbs, give somebody a bunch of choline, and where do you find choline? Egg yolks, liver, meat. That's that. I mean, that. There's your cure. There's your multi-billion-dollar cure for non-alcoholic yep. fatty liver disease. I mean, yep. that is eat your meat. It's it's not even rocket science. It's just you know your body needs right. the choline to make phosphatidylcholine, which will go into the VLDLs to export the triglycerides out of your liver. It's just like that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, and it's the same and thing with if diabetes. you if you drink too much alcohol, which is a poison, right? It's a patotoxic you'll get fatty liver, won't you? And, and any number of other toxins that are toxic to the liver, if you ingest those or are exposed to those too long, you get fatty liver. That is a sign that the liver is being poisoned. And when you stop the alcohol, now the, you know, the, the, the fibrosis and cirrhosis, the, the damage is permanent probably, but the fat in an alcoholic's liver goes away when they stop drinking, right? And the same happens for carboholics. When you get the carbs out of your diet, the fatty pancreas and fatty liver go away. No vegetables required. <clears throat> I, uh, it sounded like you were trying to protect that YouTuber's name, but I have a suspicion it might be Dr. Eric Berg, perhaps. Yeah, I, I hate to call names, but I also hate for people to be misled. Yeah. And I think he's right about so many things, and I agree with him on a great many things. But that that just that one thing alone, what it and basically what it implies is that eating meat's dangerous. Yeah. You've got to eat. You got to eat plants to cancel the danger of the meat. And I, I think that's the incorrect message. That's and completely that, that's just that's, doesn't make any yeah. sense. It's just it's just wrong. And I have great respect for Berg in many ways, but in on that one thing we we disagree one hundred percent. He's been doing some carnivore videos recently, and I was like, oh, look at you getting on yep, the carnivore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Which I'm funny. happy to see him come because he's he's very influential with millions of people. And so I'm so glad, and I I, I really hope, and I'd like to actually make the video with him is to say, yeah, you don't have to eat seven to 10 cups of vegetables to protect your liver from fatty meat. You don't. Fatty meat is good for your liver. And I also, every time I do this, I like to say protein is good for your liver. Protein is good for your kidneys. Hear me. It is not bad for your kidneys to right. eat lots of meat. It is not bad for your liver to eat lots of meat. 
That is how our kidneys and livers evolved to be the beautiful organs that they are today is because we in fact did eat lots of fatty meat. So if, if anybody's about to say, well, yeah, all that protein on carnivore, isn't that bad for your no, shut your, no, shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. Jason Fung, board certified nephrologist, right? Ha has been very blatant in his, in, in his opinion. Even in, in stage one, two, three chronic kidney disease, there is zero research that shows that eating a high protein diet, much less a moderate protein diet, harms your kidneys in any, any way. There is zero research, but so many doctors will still parrot that stupid crap, right? And that's what they're doing. They're parroting just like Polly wanted cracker. They have no damn idea what they're actually saying or how it flies in the face of even simple, basic human physiology to say that, oh, too much protein's bad for your kidney. I just want to get that doc by the hair and just throw him out of the clinic and say, don't come back here until you understand how basic human physiology works. And I think in many of those studies, the higher protein diets actually improved kidney function or potentially could improve yes. kidney function with yep. some of these yep. stage one or two or three chronic yep. kidney insufficiency, you know? So, yep. so, but I mean, those are some of the biggest myths I hear too, you know, too much protein is bad for your kidneys, it's bad for your liver. Yeah, no, it's just yeah. not. Like, and I'll take it one step further. I have had, and I had, I was keeping count for a while, but it's in the 40s. Uh, 40 to 50 patients who have literally reversed their CKD and went from stage three to stage two, stage two to stage one, stage one back to normal kidney function. And I'm not basing that on a, a creatinine. I'm basing that on their, their glomerular filtration rate, the real actual measure. It, they return to normal kidney function on a fatty meat heavy ketogenic diet. And so you can't, you can't look at me and tell me that, that fatty meat is bad for your kidneys. I've seen people reverse their kidney function eating fatty meat keto. So I don't want to hear it. No. Yeah. And so people know what we're talking about here is CKD is chronic kidney disease and GFR yep. is glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. It has to do with, right, right. it's our indication of how much, you know, plasma is being filtered through the glomerulus in the kidney. And we approximate that with a, a measure called creatinine, which is a muscle breakdown product from creatinine. It's an imperfect measure, but what Dr. Barry is suggesting is that if you look at GFR directly, you can look at this glomerular filtration rate and you can see that rate go up. That's what you want. When we see chronic kidney disease, CKD, one, two, three, that's declining glomerular filtration rate. So what we're getting is kidneys that are coming back online, which yes. is amazing. Kidneys that are yes. coming back online when people are improving their insulin sensitivity, when they're going keto or carnivore, all these things. That's incredible. Have you seen microalbuminuria improve on, on that? Yeah, well? oh, it goes away very, very quickly. Uh, and because, you know, we really only check microalbumin to, to creatinine ratios right. on people in the very earliest stages. You don't keep wasting the money checking that after you know they've got CKD2 or 3 or 4. And so, you, but yeah, definitely with somebody. And so if somebody's got that, they, they have chronic kidney disease stage one. And that's how you, that's one of the ways you can diagnose that. And it just goes away within months of eating fatty meat, keto or carnivore. It's gone. They have no, no albumin in their urine anymore. And I think Jason doesn't talk about this much, Dr. Fung, because he's, he's a nephrologist. And so his peers would crucify him if he said that, CKD was reversible, right? And I understand, you know, we got to also deal with our politics and our whatever, but I'm happy to tell you, I can pull the records. I can, I can black out the patient's names and show you within six months, this person went with it from, a, from CKD three to back to CKD one. I mean, there it is black and white. And that's, that's supposed to be impossible. And it is impossible if you keep poisoning your body with chronic carbohydrates, but if you get rid of them, magic happens the body regenerates and heals and it, it's it, it paused there for one second you were saying magic happens and it heals and then what yeah we just we, our, our organs tend to regenerate when you eat the proper human diet and stop poisoning your body i love it it's so cool and i mean there are so many diseases that both you and i have seen improve that are supposed to be incurable lupus fibromyalgia psoriasis depression anxiety you know i'm in residency at the university of washington i'll be done in like three weeks after four arduous years you know i remember being in a didactic session and on anxiety and, and you know in a flipping way you know there's lecturers senior psychiatrist md talking 
oh, this is, you know, I was like, what causes it? And she, we don't know. Does it ever go away? Usually not. You know, I'm thinking, well, you know, this yeah. is a paradigm. It's shift. idiopathic. Yeah, which, you know, we have a joke, you know, that generally that means the doctor's an idiot, you know? <laughs> like, it means but, I have no damn idea why you have this. That's what right, that means. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, the Latin interpretation. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the joke in, uh, in medicine. So you, I, I think we should maybe close with a little bit of a story about your health journey because it's, it didn't end there, right? Like when we met right. at Fogo to Chow, you said you'd been doing a mostly carnivore diet for maybe the last year or so. So tell us about that. Like what's happened? Yeah. Like, what have you noticed in your keto to carnivore transition? So with keto, when I was doing hardcore keto for probably two and a half years, dude, I had gotten so many improvements in my health. I had reversed my type my pre-diabetes, my chronic severe GERD. I'm talking 10 out of 10. Like I'd had the nurses hook me up on the EKG three times to make sure this wasn't cardiac. That's how bad it hurts. And no, it's just, it was just my heartburn. And so that was 80% better with keto. My allergies, 80, 85, 90% better with keto. My dandruff completely gone with keto. My rosacea, which was getting pretty noticeable, completely gone with keto. My chronic joint pain, 95% better with keto, right? And I kept seeing this stupid Neanderthal, Sean Baker guy, right? And I'm like, oh, I don't know about this. Then I started hearing you and, and the guy that lives in the jungle, Tristan, right? And I was like, I don't know. I'm going to try this for a month. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to try it. I'll just do a carnivore challenge on my Facebook page, right? And anybody wants to do it with me, let's do a carnivore month and see what happens. And at the end of that month, a, a, a miracle happened. I had not had a day without at least some degree of, of gastric reflux, heartburn pain since I was in my early 20s. Literally every single day of my life, I, had to, I would have to swallow and clear my throat. And I, and I couldn't, like, I couldn't have done this right after I'd eat because I would have been clearing my throat and, and trying to swallow and taking a Tums. I just couldn't have done this interview, right? But now, literally one minute before I was talking to you, I was shoveling beef into my face. Not joking, right? The hound. Beef and bacon. Hound. That's what I was just, yeah, I was like the hound on Game of Thrones. But I have, I, I'm, I'm able to do this. And so after a month of carnivore, I'd lost seven more pounds which I figured was still probably some inflammatory fluid that was sequestered, right? Just from the inflammation from the carbs and whatever's in the veg that I was allergic to. My heartburn was gone, Saladino, gone. And if, if nobody's, if you've never had heartburn daily, severe, you don't even understand that. But for, for anybody listening, yeah, it was that miraculous. And I'm not joking. It was 100% gone. And I thought I would never have that again until I was in the casket. I didn't think that would ever happen, right? The, my allergy is completely gone. Like I said, I could go pitchfork hay in a 20-year-old barn for five-year-old hay all day and maybe sneeze once. Unheard of. Uh, my joint pain is now gone. Last night, I was deadlifting 285 pounds for many reps. Never could I have done that in my, my 30s, right? I would, have, my, I would have been stoved up, as we say in the South. For two weeks, if I had tried to do that, I couldn't have done that. And I'm not even sore today, so I'm going to have to jack it up. I'm going to have to jack it up next time. That wasn't enough weight. But, yeah, and so I'm like, you know, at the end of that month, I'm like, huh, I'm going to do this for another month. That was pretty cool. And so I just kept extending the experiment, and I'm on month 13 now. And I just turned 50 in uh, December, December the 9th. Don't be sending me stuff. I'm just, I'm just trying to lay, lay the story out here, right? <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I'm going to start lifting weights. So I bought a cage and some, weight, some weights, and I started working out at 50. And I, I try once a month to post update pictures on my Facebook page just to show people, yeah, I'm eating effectively zero carb, and I'm, I'm an old man. I'm 50. And you can put on muscle. So you can tell all the 20-year-old gym rats and say you gotta carb up or you never just shut your mouth dude you don't know what you're talking about yeah look at this 50 year old guy shut up yeah you can and so i'm I, I don't know when i'll stop my carnivore experiment because it's going so well and every now and then i'll i'll have one of misha's brussels sprouts right or i'll have a, a bite of her fat snacks cookie or something because she's still keto and while she's pregnant, she's doing a, probably 100, 100 grams total a day, but keto approved carbs, right? Because usually in your first trimester, you can eat, you're much more insulin sensitive. You can eat a lot more carbs and it's just for the baby. It's not for you. And uh, I'll have a bite of that. It's not a big deal. But, I, but the cravings, Paul, are gone. Like used to, my jam was a, was a hot fudge cake. I mean, if you set that in front of me, 
my willpower was gone. That was it. I was about to, I would smash that thing, right? But now, even when I'm hungry, you could sit that in front of me and I'd be like, no, it, it just don't do it for me anymore. It's like an old ex-girlfriend that you broke up with really badly, right? It was a terrible breakup. You might be like, yeah, I, I, she's hot and all, but I have no interest. What, I just, no, I'm just not even interested. No, I don't want to talk about it. And that's how I feel about hot fudge cake now, which is also a little miraculous. When you used to be the, the, the sugar zombie that I was back in my 30s, that's pretty crazy to say, no, dude, there'll come a day when you walk away from fresh hot fudge cake without even touching it. I'd have been like, okay, <laughs> that's never going to happen. That's amazing. You know, I was in the grocery store the other day uh, in Los Angeles and uh, I, I, grocery stores are such a different experience for me. And I bet it's the same for you. I just walk around the grocery store and it's like, it's just like you're saying, it's kind of funny. It's like all these ex-girlfriends there, you know, whether it's in the fruit or the produce. You're, like, and you're just like, I'm good. Like I got, I got the real, I'm so good. I'm I got so the really good, good yeah. woman now. Like I got the good, I'm going straight for the meat counter. Like I know where yep. my woman is, you know, like uh -huh. I know where, I know where my, you know, where yeah. my, where my person is. And you just walk through and you're just like, none of this means anything to me. None of this tempts me nope. at all. Nope. I walk, I mean, personally, you know, I walk past the kombucha. I'm like, eh, you ain't got nothing on me. Topo Chico yeah. is my weakness. I'll do some, I'll do some mineral water, but that's about the only thing, you know, outside of the meat counter. I just walk up to the meat counter at Whole Foods and I'm like, what do you have in terms of organs? And I just want to know, do you have liver? Do you have any yep. trimmings? And all right, I'll get some grass fed beef, but really I want the liver and the organs and stuff. So it's just funny. And I walk in the grocery store and I'm like, you all got no, you got no, there's no temptation here anymore. It's crazy. No, it's totally true. It's like I walked right past the granola now without even giving it a glance on my way to the ribeye. And that's very analogous to my, my personal life. I mean, I got ribeye sitting in the next room. What the hell? I want to be wasting time with a granola bar board. Right? Yeah. You you got the best food. You got the best food. <laughs> are you doing, are you doing like, what kind of organ stuff do you like? So I've got a, a local guy who, who will get me beef liver. Nice. And so I, I grind that up into my, with my ground beef. And so for every two pounds of ground beef, I'll put about a half, three quarters of a pound of liver. And then Nisha's dad, Pedro is a big hunter. And so he's always hunting wild turkey, deer. And so I always have venison hearts and, and turkey hearts. I always have access to this kind of stuff that I can grind up and put in my ground beef. Um, I tried a beef kidney and that didn't go well. That, <laughs> that was terrible. I, I, there must be a trick to that. I, my entire house smelled like a really poorly kept nursing home. It was terrible. <laughs> Kidneys a little days. tough. And I was like, well, I, I don't know. There's got to be a trick to that. But uh, yeah, but heart and liver all day. And then, and then in the South, in Tennessee, you can still go to the kind of the locally owned restaurants and you can get a delicacy that's called brains and eggs and it's scrambled eggs with pork brains. You can still get that in one or two restaurants here in Camden and in most places in the South, other places in the world look like you like you need to be, you know, you need to call the psychiatrist if you ask for that, but you can still have access to brains. And then we've got a, a uh, instant pot full of bone broth right now. Love it. I, I get, I get my butcher. He'll chop up all of the leg bones into like three inch sections. And so I've got that, you know, you just imagine that beef femur with that huge hunk of marrow in it. And so I make the most magical bone broth you could ever. And Nisha hates it right now because when I cook it, it stinks up the house and she's got that pregnant nose and she can't uh -huh. tolerate it right now. So I haven't been making much, but as soon as she's over this thing, we're going to, we'll have bone broth all the time. And I love that stuff. And the, I think the moral of the story is make friends with your butcher. Like, yes, the butcher yep. becomes your best friend. He's like, Hey, yep. I got some good brain. You want some good brain? You know? yep. And I had read, I just read yesterday, Paul, that actually I think in the federal guidelines, butchers can put as much beef heart into ground beef as they want to. Most been everybody out. But now that this is starting to be a thing, there are butchers that are starting to have, you know, like a fatty ground beef that's got 10% beef heart. And so now they don't have to throw all these hearts and waste all this CoQ10 and all this beautiful nutrition that's in beef hearts. We can actually start to eat that now that we're not freaked out by it anymore. I saw that and people were freaking out. They were like, oh, I don't want heart or tongue in my ground beef. And I thought, yeah, they can put as much heart or tongue as they want, right? That's the best. And they just thing haven't been you. doing it. Oh, my yeah. God.
That's the best thing for you. Wow. Now, when we were at Fogo, you told me an anecdote that I thought was really striking. And this has to do with something that I think is really tragic and sad that your clinic actually burned down recently, if people aren't aware of this. And when I heard about this, I thought, oh, man, I can't. I've got to think there's foul play going on here. And, And, you know, I don't I don't know if you believe that or not, but you just got to think like, why does one building burn? But you know, what was really striking for me was the way re- you react to that. So, I mean, just tell people a little bit about that experience and how it struck you and just the way yeah. that you handled it. So just to, to, to kind of quash any conspiracy theories, I immediately had the same thought as you had. I was like, what? Are you kidding me? Uh, but the, the state, arson investigators came and they had like eight agents they brought the big forensic truck because it's such a huge clinic and they looked for two days and they're like nah it's undetermined cause we can't find anything we can put our finger on and then the insurance company because it's going to be a big claim they had their guy come out and look for two or three days actually about two weeks and he's like yeah undetermined cause probably lightning strike we don't know Hmm. and so that's the official cause is undetermined slash lightning strike slash act of God. That's how it's going to be put on the, the claim. But just to kind of give you, you know, hearkening back to the people that say, oh, you're, if you do, you know, keto or carnivore, your cortisol level and epinephrine levels are going to be chronically high. Back when I was 35, 33, 34, 35, I was chronically pissed off. Everything made me mad. Everything got under my skin. Every human on the planet bothered me. Like, why are you annoying me, right? That was just who I was back then. And now, I, and I, I think probably part of it is as I, you know, I'm old and I've grown the hell up and got over a lot myself in a lot of ways. But I can't help but think that it's at least in part due to the diet. But, the, you know, when I, when I got the knock on the door at 5.15 that morning and went there, I was obviously upset. You know, I almost passed out standing there watching this baby. It's actually like one of my children that I had built from the ground up go up and smoke. But Nisha came and she was crying and we were, you know, consoling each other. And then we got home later that day. She said, you know what? This doesn't have to be a stumbling block. This could be a stepping stone. And, and if she had said that to me when I was 35, Paul, I can't, I can't even estimate the amount of furniture that would have been broken (laughs) at her saying such an idiotic thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, what the hell are you? What? Right. But immediately I was like, no, you're right. This doesn't have, this can actually be something better than it was before. And, and I can't help but think that that's in part due to me now eating the proper human diet and, and my brain not being chronically inflamed and chronically poisoned by the chronic garbage that I used to think was real food. And so we'll never know for sure what percentage, you know, age versus wisdom versus diet but I can just tell you that 35, I would have not reacted to her statement like I did that, that morning right after I had just lost the clinic that I had built and built and, and ran for t- almost 20 years. I was immediately like, no. And so it makes you very stoic. It makes you almost very zen. When you're feeding your brain what it actually needs, you can just see the bigger picture. It's almost like you see the world from a thousand feet instead of being right in the middle of the forest. You can just look and go, yeah, you're right. That's exactly right. Instead of becoming immediately emotional and upset, that's, that's not what I go for anymore. I go, I'm just, I'm a thinker now. I'm a, it's really, the, and, and, and even me saying this now, it sounds weird coming out of my own mouth because anybody that knew me back then would be like, Oh my God, did you say that and then run? Cause that's what, that's what you should have done back then but now it's like no you you speak truth to me i hear you and that's the way i am with the nutrition if you can prove me wrong if you can prove that you need seven to ten cups of vegetables a day i'll stand corrected immediately because think about it back in 0304 i was completely ass backwards on everything i changed my mind then so you don't think i can change it again i'm not i'm not emotionally committed to, to fatty meat keto or carnivore i just know that's what works and, and if you show me research tomorrow, I'll, I'll consider it. I'll look at it. I'll read it. I'll look at the references because I'm happy to be proven wrong because that means I just got smarter. 
I feel the same way. I, I hope somebody comes along and proves us both wrong. I don't think it's going to happen, but we'll learn so much. Won't we? We'll be like, wait, what? <laughs> we'll be like, wow. Okay. Well, that's amazing. So maybe they will. Yep. We'll, we'll, we'll try and stay open. Yeah. That's just so striking. When you told me that I was like, oh my gosh, that's such a cool story. You know, such a tragic, heartbreaking thing happened. I'm so sorry to hear about that. And yet you were able to handle that with so much poise. That's just not normal for a human being. Nope. And it really right. resonated with me because when I went carnivore, I noticed a similar type of thing within the first few days. I had so much more mental sort of poise, emotional resilience was sort of how I, how I termed it. And I thought, oh man, yes. this is interesting. I was much less likely to fail the I'm going to yell at you in traffic test, you know, which I think is such an indication. <laughs> so there's something going on there. I mean, you know, if, if, if meat is wrong, I don't want to be right, you know, because I uh, totally agree. It feels good. <laughs> and it, I'm just calm and I'm happier and, you know, everything feels good. So, well, yeah. Ken, it's been a pleasure and an honor having you on. Where can people find your stuff? I see your, your shiny YouTube award there in the background. I know you've got a, yeah. you've got a game. I'm working on the gold one now. I know. What is the gold? Silver. I got to get the gold. Is it's, it gold? Uh, you got to get a million to get the gold. So. I'm sure you'll be there really soon. Well, tell people where I'm they can trying. find you. So if you just go to YouTube and, and search for Dr. Barry, you'll find me pretty quickly there. Same, and, and, and then also on Facebook, just search for Dr. Ken Barry and you'll find me. And that's where I do the majority of my, my work. That's what I call this, Paul, is work. It's weird. And I'm also on Instagram. If I'm feeling particularly salty or snarky, then you'll find me on Twitter. Uh, and, and so, yeah, it just depends on what message I'm trying to get out there and whom I'm trying to reach as to which social media I'm on. I also have a website, kendyberry.com. And then I've got that book I wrote. Right. It's in Barnes and Noble on Amazon. It's in uh, paperback and Kindle now. And then uh, Carl Franklin from the two keto dudes, he's going to be reading the audible version. And I'm actually going to fly up and, and, and at the end of each chapter, we're going to riff. I don't know if you, have you read Go Goggins Can't Hurt Me? Uh, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it yet. Okay, so at the end of each chapter, he kind of riffs with the narrator. And I thought that was brilliant, right? So I'm going to fly up to New London, Connecticut. And, and at the end of each chapter, he's going to kind of go into more detail, ask me some questions. And so the book will probably wind up being 82 hours long because, you know, I have trouble shutting up. <laughs> so I don't know how that, but it'll, I think it'll be a great listen when it's out in June. And that is the book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. And you, this is yes. the new edition is coming out, like just came out. It's out right? now. Yep, just lies came out. Yep. Me. yep. And then, you know, in this podcast, we really went through some of those, all these myths that you're sort of debunking. And I think it's so helpful for people to, to do that. So I would recommend everyone check that out. And I know you're on YouTube. You gave a talk at Low Carb, Seattle, or Low Carb Salt Lake that I was watching. So check out Ken's stuff there. There was one other thing I was going to think about, but it's escaping me now. But, you know, that's awesome. I'm glad people can find in those spots. Oh, this is what I was going to ask. The clinic is... The clinic has gone to heaven, but you are still seeing patients virtually, right? If somebody, yeah, wants, yeah, somebody yeah. wants to work with you, they, how do they get in touch with you to become yeah. a virtual? I imagine you probably have a wait list, but if somebody I wanted do, to yeah. your patient. There is a waiting list, but if you want to do, if you want to work with me remotely, and it'll just be wellness coaching. It won't be legal medical advice. You'll just be basically picking my brain. Go to my website, and you can find information about being a virtual client there. We have full intentions of rebuilding the clinic if the uh, structure is still structurally sound, but we're still waiting. The engineer came yesterday and took a bunch of measurements and photos because the building was actually built in 1905. And so they're worried that the old brick, the fire got too hot and we'll, we won't be able to rebuild. But that's the plan as of now. And I'm going to keep putting out YouTube videos and, and Nisha and I go live on our, my Facebook page every Monday night at 7 PM central. And, and we help so many people there. And so I'm having a blast on social media and I don't plan on ever stopping that unless, uh, you know, big food or big pharma comes at me with the assassin or something. <laughs> so if I, if I commit suicide, Mm -mm, you need to look into that, okay? Because that ain't going to happen. <laughs> I, I think that the hopefully all that would happen is somebody would throw a Beyond Meat burger at you, and nothing, <laughs> nothing as tragic as a real thing would happen. We That's don't, we don't want to toxic. You got to stick around. I think about the same thing too. People are like, "Aren't you scared?" I'm like, "No, I'm not." I mean, no, bring it, but bring it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're carnivores, man. We're ready for the fight. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs>
So thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. I would encourage people to reach out to you in those outlets and look for you. And I look forward to future collaborations and eating another steak with you soon, my friend. Absolutely, brother. I'll see you next time. All right.